Today we're going to talk out of 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're starting a new series through 1 Peter. And this book of 1 Peter speaks profoundly to certain areas of our life. As I was thinking about this passage, I was thinking of an aspect of my life, a certain thing that I've done for a long time that I don't like to do as much anymore. How many of you really, really, really love flying on an airplane? Like, I know I'm traveling. I love. How many, like, terrified, will not step foot on an airplane? Like, no way, not doing it. So I've had the privilege of being able to fly around a lot. My grandmother lives in Spain, so we've been able to visit her. That's, that's been a lot of fun. We, growing up, we would visit during the summer. But there's something about as I've gotten older, I'm a little bit more reluctant to go on a plane. And I'll tell you why. I cannot stand the feeling of when you're on a plane and it drops a little bit. I can't, uh, I know some of you guys live for that. You're like, oh, that's why I go to roller coasters and ride. Like, that's like a nightmare feeling for me. I don't like the drop. And so I was on a plane not too long ago. I was going to, um, I was going to Spain. And, you know, you're over an ocean. You're on the plane for five hours. You're in the middle of the ocean. And the pilot says, hey, just so you know, we're about to go through some turbulence. So I'm like, okay. So the seatbelt sign goes on. You know, the, it starts getting a little rocky. You know it gets really, really bad when the stewardesses start sitting down. <laughs> then you start thinking like, wait a minute. I've seen this in the movie. We go down next. <laughs> and so, you know, we're, we're sitting there. And, um, and, and I'm watching, and it's, you know, it's starting to shake, and, you know, you start playing thoughts in your mind, like, what are the chances that the plane will go down, and I'll be the only one, and I'll be in my life vest, kind of like, help me, Jesus, kind of floating around in the water. And, and on this particular plane, it starts dropping a little bit, and then, seriously, it seems like it gets worse the more that I fly. This was like big drops. And we were doing these dramatic drops, and everyone's like holding on to each other and breathing heavy. And, and, and this makes it extra worse. This time when I was flying on the plane, I don't remember which movie I was watching, but in the movie I was watching, the plane was going through turbulence. And the plane started to go down in the movie. They're like, okay, everyone buckle in. We're going to go for a crash landing. I'm like, so now I'm watching it. The plane is turbulent. It's messing with my mind. I had to shut it off, put Dora on or something, put on the next movie. But there's something about that feeling I just can't stand. You know, I like when it's smooth. I'm even good with the takeoff. But there's something about being in a turbulent storm. Where it's up and down and your heart's racing, you don't know what's next. And I get really crazy with my prayers. I start praying, God, listen, either let it go smooth or take me quick and just let it be a nosedive. God, I don't want to, you know, go through this whole bed. Just like, take me quick. I'm ready to be with you. I pray a lot when I'm on the plane. And as I was thinking about being on a plane and how sometimes they're smooth and it's not rocky, and other times it's turbulent and you get nervous. I was thinking how similar that is to our lives. And how sometimes you just feel like everything's going smooth. You're looking out the window. You're enjoying your time. You're with people you love. You feel like life could not be better than this. Let me tell you, I have had some dark, dark seasons in life. I've had some moments where I say, I don't see the purpose of living. And God has blessed me at least in this last, at least the last two years, when people ask me how I'm doing, you know, sometimes we can give them a fake answer, but praise be to God, I feel like the last two years of my life and the season I'm in right now is the best season of my life I've ever been in. Praise God, because I've been in the pit for long seasons. But here's what I know. I know that even though I feel like I'm going through one of the best seasons of my life right now, each and every single one of us in this room will go through a trial and a storm and a turbulent season in your life where you'll start to question a lot of things. It's part of the nature, I think, of what we experience that it's not always an upward experience. Sometimes there's longer seasons where it feels like it's going well, but every once in a while you feel like it feels like it's going down. It feels like things are getting worse. 
Feels like my relationships are decaying or I'm not where I want to be financially or in the career that I want to be in. And you just start to look at your life and it seems like my life could not be going worse right now. I feel like I'm at the lowest of the low. Regardless, if you feel like you're in my season right now and praise God that you're there and you feel like this is going phenomenal or if you feel like you are going through one of the most difficult seasons of your life, each and every one of us needs to know how to navigate the low seasons of life. First Peter is going to tell us and talk to us about how to navigate, how to make sure that when we enter some of those dark seasons of life, how to navigate and make sure that we get out of those, how to avoid, let me even say this, how to avoid going down the spiral of a bad season. You can't avoid all of them, but you can avoid some dark seasons in life. So if you have your Bibles this morning, let's search the scripture for some answers of how to get through the lows of life. We're going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3, right at the end of your Bible. Blessed be the Lord, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith by salvation ready to be revealed in the last time one of the things that I've noticed about myself when I go through a dark season or I feel like I'm going through a turbulent season or an unknown season of my life one of the things that I've learned is oftentimes my thoughts can get very very negative It seems like sometimes when life is going bad and things are going wrong, it seems like your thoughts many times just follow your actions. And it's hard to be able to thank God and to be able to see the positive side of things when things are just going wrong. The author of this book is the Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' close three disciples. And he's speaking to new believers, young believers, People have made a decision to follow Jesus, but they're just trying to learn how to grow in him. And to make it more difficult, just trying to learn how to live for God in the right way, these Christians are actually being persecuted. So they're having their homes taken away from them. They're having their, their, their finances destroyed. There's people that are actually being murdered, killed, slaughtered for the name, for following Jesus Christ. I mean, this is the season that the church is in at this time. He's not just saying, hey, you kind of people out there who are kind of, he's like, hey, Christians, I'm speaking to you who are being severely persecuted in this season. And the first thing he says to them, it says, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how difficult it is to praise God when, it fe- when you feel like everything's going wrong? Hey, when things are going right and you got that job promotion, or you got into that school that you wanted to, or your kids are doing well, when your health is on the up, it's easy to praise God. Oh, God, you're good. You're merciful. Thank you for being kind and loving and compassionate. Thank you for giving me that boost. Thank you for giving me that. But when it gets hard, when you're on a road that you don't want to be on, when your health is not going the direction you want to it's to go in and you get that bad report and your kids aren't where you want them to be and they're doing poorly in school and you feel like things are unraveling and falling apart the hardest thing to do is to praise God oftentimes we can be so focused on the negative that we forget to praise God but let me just say this let me say this one of the lessons that I've learned in the middle of the storm is even though your mind is going to default to go to the negative things we need to remember God's goodness our default is going to be look at the problems in our life and the things that are going wrong but that's not what we need to focus on when we're in the middle of the storm What we need to focus on when we're in the middle of the storm is remembering, even though our season seems difficult, remembering the goodness of God. 
Peter doesn't just, doesn't just say praise God, but he says praise God for something specific. Praise God for the work that has been done through Jesus. Hey, let me say this. Even when everything is going wrong in your life, you and I still have things to be thankful for. You say, well, my car breaks down every other week, but hey, praise God that you have a car. Hey, your health. You might be experiencing some pain in your body and you don't wonder why this se- you're wondering why this season has gone on so long and you're praying and asking God and you feel like this is all going wrong in my health. But hey, praise God that you're alive. Hey, your kids might not be where you want them to be, but praise God that he's entrusted you with those kids. Even in the midst of times when we feel like everything is going wrong, there are still times and things to thank God for, not just in the past, but also in the present. My mom was telling me about a conversation she had recently with a wife, and this wife was in her young 20s, and her husband had died unexpectedly. And she had, they had a young, a less than one-year-old child together. This just happened recently. And my mom was talking to this, to this wife. And the wife was telling her this. She said, you know what? I've, I've learned. I've learned a whole other perspective. The things that I used to complain about, about my husband. He wouldn't do the dishes. He'd leave his stuff around the house. His snoring at night was terrible. She said, the little things that I used to complain about for my husband, she said, do you know what I would give to hear him snore just one more time? You know, sometimes we think that this is the worst that life can get, and oftentimes it's once that's actually been taken from us when we realize how much it meant to us. You know, it's a, you, you realize how much you love someone once you've lost them. You realize how important and how thankful you are for your health when everyone else around you has a flu or they're sick or they're in the hospital on life support. You thank God, thank you that I have my health. Hey, you thank God for your job, even when I, your finances aren't where you want them to be, but you, you're like, hey, at least I'm able to have food on my table. Sometimes it's, you, you, don't, you don't realize how thankful you are until you've lost that job. And you say, man, I just was happy I had a job. Peter says, praise God for the work that has been done. And he moves on and says, not only praise God, but he moves on and says, according to his great mercy, he caused us to be born again. See, what's powerful, and this hit me several years back, is that God would be good and just even if he never sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Sometimes we think, well, you know, God had to send Jesus to be a sacrifice for us. God had to send his son to die in us. But can, I, can I tell you that? Jesus, God didn't have to send Jesus to make a way right for people to be right with him. God would have been just as good, just as beautiful, just as just if he would have never sent Jesus. Well, why? Why did he send? It was his great mercy. And how amazing is it when sometimes you look back at the stories of your life and you said, thank you, God, for your mercy. Because when I was away from you, I was sleeping around with people and I could have contracted some type of disease. Thank you, God, that when I was away, you protected me. Hey, when you're driving and you were getting drunk and you were living the way that you used to live and God protected you, even though those nights when you were driving around, we say, thank you, God, for your mercy that when I was lost, you protected me. My story could have been over, but it's because your mercy that I still have breath in my lungs. Thank you, God, for your mercy. And more than anything, Peter's saying, hey, remember that when you're in the storm, there's a lot of material things that we can thank God for. There's a lot of things he's given us that we can thank God for. There's our health and our mind that we can thank God for. But never, 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 never forget the ultimate gift that God has given us. He has given us a new life through his son, Jesus. Let us... 
Let us never forget the mercy. Let us, let us never fall into the trap to think that I deserve Jesus to die on the cross for me or he had to. Let us never fall into that trap where we get complacent around hearing the gospel or we're not moved when we hear about the truth of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. The Bible says we were enemies of him. The Bible says when we were still sinners, he died for us. See, when I'm in a dark season of my life and I look at, I look around and I feel like everything's going wrong and my relationships aren't where I want them to be and I'm not where I want to be in my finances and I'm stressed about the next season. Sometimes just I have to pause. And I just take out a piece of paper, I'm driving in the car, and I just make a list of things and thank God for how good he's been to me in my life. Sometimes I have to force myself to be thankful, force myself to reflect on how good he's been, and I want to never forget when I'm thanking him for everything, I want to never forget the ultimate sacrifice of his son dying on the cross because he's given me new life. He says, according to his great mercy, and at the end of verse 3, he says, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, each and every one of us was physically born. There's no one in here who was raised or born in a lab. Each and every one of us was born to a family. And each and every one, no one, no one just came into the world. Even if it was a dysfunctional family, you were born into a family. The truth of this, what Jesus is teaching here, is ultimately found in John chapter 3. When Peter says, born again, he calls us to be born again. This word literally, when you look at the translation, it means born from above. So when Peter and when Jesus are talking about this concept, you need to be born again. They're saying, you need to be born from heaven. You need to be born from God. And in John chapter 3, when Jesus explains this topic for the first time, Nicodemus, who's a religious man, asked a very simple and kind of plain question that we would have asked as well. He's kind of like, how can I be born again? I cannot go back into my mother's womb. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. That's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about a spiritual rebirth. See, each and every one of us, we have a physical body. We have a soul or a mind. That's your thoughts. That's your emotions. That's your personality. It's the essence of who you are. And each and every one of us has a spirit. The spirit is the part of you that's able to relate to God. But the problem is that each and every one of us is born spiritually dead. So although you might be 40 years old with a body that's healthy and a heart that's beating, and you might have a great personality and a very smart mind, you can be great with people, be alive in a mind, in your mind sense, be alive in a body sense, but be dead spiritually. John is referring to this concept saying, your first birth was a physical one, but the new birth, the being born again, what I'm talking about is a spiritual birth. That it's only by the work of God that he can make you alive. And that's not poetry. When we read in the Bible, there's a moment when we come to the truth. There's a moment when we wake up. And it doesn't matter if it's the thousandth time you've heard the gospel, it's the first time you heard the gospel. And it's just like something you heard in this moment made it so clear in your life. And you, do, you realize that Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And you give yourself over to him, not simply believing it intellectually, but trusting him with everything that you are. And at that moment and at that time, regardless if you're in a church building or on a bus or on a street corner, God imparts his spirit into you and you are made alive. Alive. Faith is not simply believing that Jesus walked the face of the earth. Can I tell you every historian, whether they're a Christian or a secular historian, believes that Jesus walked the face of the earth? 
If you're in the historical, uh, or if you're in the historical field and you're saying, I don't believe that Jesus was a real historical figure, people will laugh at you. That is not the debate if Jesus walked the face of the earth. It's very well known Jesus walked the face of the earth. He was Israel. The question that people have is, is Jesus who he claimed to be God? And so our faith is not simply believing that Jesus was a person or that Jesus was a teacher or that Jesus was a prophet or that Jesus had some profound teachings. Our faith is based upon do we trust that Jesus is God so much so that it changes the way that we live? I talked to somebody the last service, and I'll try not to choke up this service. I don't think I will, but I was talking to somebody before I went and preached the first service, and they were telling me, I asked them, I said, how are you doing in this season? They said, I am doing so good. They said, amazing. I said, why? I said, tell me that. That's, that's, a lot of people don't give that answer. Why are you doing so amazing? He said, man, God's just been so good to me. He's blessed me with so much. He's given me an amazing wife, and, and, and I'm, I'm you know, going to start a family, and it clicked in my mind because I just saw it on Instagram the other day, and I, just, I remember that he was, he, they just found out that his wife was pregnant, and I gave him a hug. I'm, I'm so excited for you. You're going to be a great dad, and he looked at me, and he said, you know what? You could tell he was holding back tears. He said, you know what? He said, I am so happy right now and so filled because I used to believe that no one loved me. He said, I used to live my life and I didn't have anybody that loved me and I didn't believe that anybody loved me. He said, then I came to Christ and God gave me a family and not only a physical, biological family that I can start with my own, but God gave me a spiritual family. And he said, I am so loved right now and surrounded by people that love and care for me. My life is transformed. I'm a different person. And he had to stop because he was starting to get choked up. And I was thinking, how powerful is that? That someone who feels like they're not loved, they're not cared for, they're not appreciated, like no one accepts me. God gets a hold of their life and starts flipping it upside down where somebody who feels like they're not loved and they don't have a purpose is now someone who's the complete opposite. They feel like they're loved, their life is overflowing with love, and they have a purpose. See, when you come to Jesus and it's a real transformation of your life, you don't stay the same. It might take some time for you to start really changing in a powerful way, but God will start to transform who you are. And you might say, hey, I was a depressed person, but you start walking with God and he starts pulling you out of that pit and you become somebody who's filled with joy and is overwhelming, overwhelming uh, satisfaction of life. Hey, you might be an angry person who belittles everyone around you, but you start coming to Christ. And you get serious about your walk with Jesus, and he starts transforming you to be someone who's kind and loving and cares and compassionate. That's the power of the gospel, that when God makes you spiritually alive, your life starts changing. Praise God. See, we're born again when we repent of our sin and put faith in Jesus. Not simply intellectually believing, but saying, Jesus, I know the ways I was living is wrong. I turn from that. I put my trust and my faith in you, and I will start living the way you've called me to live. And it's only by a work of his spirit that he starts transforming our life. There's no power we have that's in our own. It's the power of God that transforms people's lives. Peter continues and says he's born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a living hope. Our hope is in a living, eternal Savior who conquered death. You know, I meet so many people who are so hopeless. Or they put their hope in the wrong things. They put their hope in money and the second that the stock market crashes, people start losing their mind, filled with anxiety because they put all their hope into money. I'm a, I, put, I meet people who put all their hope into a relationship thinking that this next person will change my life. And if I just get the right person at the right time, then I'll live the life I want to live. I meet so many people that put their hope in politics. 
It's just who's the next president and who's the next party. And if this party or this person was in power, then our world would be changed and we would have a great, you know, there's so many people put their thing in, put their hope into things that can ultimately disappoint them. And I love, I love that Peter's saying, hey, we have a hope in a living, eternal Savior. It's a living hope. It's directly tied to the resurrection of Jesus. And let me tell you something, Jesus doesn't change. When you put your hope and your faith in Jesus, you will never be disappointed when you fully trust him with everything. He doesn't go up and down like the stock market. He always stays the same because he's perfect. Let me ask you. What are you putting your hope into? Is it into a person? Is it into the next position? Is it into the money you have? Is it into a dream? Or do you put your hope in the one who will never disappoint you? is born again to a living hope, hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Listen to this. To an inheritance, verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. See, every time somebody is born on earth to a human, they're born into a family. And the same truth is, the, is, is a reality for a spiritual family as well. When we give our life over to God, we are born again, a second birth, a spiritual birth. And guess what? You are brought into a family, not a dysfunctional family either. You and I, oh, take this truth. You and I are brought into the royal family of God. There is no family higher than the family that we've been brought into, that God has adopted us into his family, a perfect family with a perfect track record. That's the family that God invites you into the moment that you put your trust and faith in him. And because you're part of an eternal, royal, powerful family of God, because you have God as your dad or your daddy, that you can actually come before him and say, Father, Dad, like a child to their parent. God not only gives you a new life, but God gives you an inheritance because you're a child of his. He says he gives you an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. Hey, listen, this is not one of the inheritance that gets lost in the courts. This is not an inheritance that you have to fight for. This is an inheritance that God gives you simply because you're his child. It can't be taken away from you. It can't fade away. It can't be robbed from you. This is an inheritance that God has given to you. An inheritance is something that's passed down from your father to you. It's a gift or a legacy. It's something you receive as a gift because you're part of a family. You were born into it. I say, well, what is our inheritance? God's a good gift giver. What is the inheritance that God has given us as his children? The inheritance is a couple things. Number one, he's given you eternity in paradise. You and I, one day, no matter if it's a car crash or you live a long life and it's on your deathbed, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, the moment you die, you go to be in paradise with Jesus. Paradise with Christ. Where there's no sickness, there's no suffering, there's no pain, there's no death, there's no anguish, there's no tears. The most valuable things on earth are the, the roads you walked on. It says heaven has streets of gold. The most valuable thing is what we walk on in heaven. And God has said, hey, listen, that's something I'm giving you, heaven. Not only that, but the final full salvation. Not that you're not saved now, but you still live in a broken world. And one day you will feel the full effects of salvation living in a perfect paradise with me. And the last but not least, we inherit God. In Joshua chapter 13, Moses distributes the land to the different people, but to the Levites, who were the religious priests. He doesn't give them land, but this is what he gives them. He says, the Lord 
the God of Israel is your inheritance. The inheritance that we get is that we get to have God unfiltered. We get to experience him in all that he is, not just part of him, not just kind of a far distant version of God. But even if your relationship is as good as it is now, we will have such a more intimate, deep relationship with God in heaven. See, what's on earth can be earned, given, or lost, but not God's inheritance. See, Peter is teaching us how to not be troubled by earthly trouble. And and let let me say this. You know, sometimes when we're living in life, sometimes when we're just doing the journey, the walk with God, sometimes it feels like, have you ever been on a treadmill and you're working out with somebody and maybe they have the timer and they're holding the timer and you're, you're running and you've been running your sprints or whatever and you're getting tired and you get to a point where you've been on that treadmill so long where you just want to give up. You're like, okay, okay, like how much longer? How much longer? And they go, oh, just, just a minute or two. Okay, okay. Okay, how much longer? If you're like me, you ask like every second. You're like, how much longer though? How much longer now? It's like, dude, it's only been 10 seconds. Okay, how much longer? And there's something about knowing. Hear me clearly. There's something about knowing that you have a short amount of time left. There's something about knowing when it's getting hard that you just have to hold on for a little bit longer. There's something about when things get difficult, when you know this is not a season of hardship forever. This is just temporary. When you know that, there's something about knowing that there's just a couple seconds or minutes left on the clock that allows you to just keep going. If you know things are temporary and it's not forever, it allows you to keep moving forward. No matter what you're going through right now, whether it's an ailment in your body and you feel like I have fought cancer five, six different times and it keeps coming back and I'm tired, whether it's something a marriage that you're going back and forth in and you feel like I have fought for my kids for so long and I'm tired and I don't want to keep fighting this battle, whether it's financial problems or debt that you've been going through and going through and going through, let me tell you this, nothing on earth is eternal. Everything is temporary. Let me say that one more time. Nothing on earth is eternal. Everything is temporary. So no matter how bad your season and how dark your season seems, no matter how bad your relationship is or how, how bad and ready you are to just move on, just, just hold on a little bit longer because it's only temporary. It's only temporary. And when things start to unravel in my life, And I'm trying to get, you know, maybe sometimes you're on that low already and you're trying to get out of it. There's something about realizing and setting your mind on eternity to realize this will not go on forever. This will not go on forever. You know, when I injured my foot at the beginning of the year, I felt like it was going to go on forever. I'm eight, seven, eight, I was like, it, was, it went seven or eight weeks long, but I'm about five or six weeks into my injured foot. I'm on crutches, I'm not walking, and I felt like it wasn't going to end. I didn't have an answer what was wrong with my foot. I didn't know when I was going to be off crutches. I didn't know when I was going to be able to drive again, and it starts to weigh on your mind. It starts to wear you down a little bit when you feel like this could be a year, this could be years, this could be permanent. When you start to think that this is never going to end, you start getting real dark in your thinking. But if you have the right perspective that this is just temporary, if you have the right perspective to think it actually will get better after this, Like, it actually, when I die, it actually, I go into perfect paradise bliss with God. I'm more alive than ever before. When you really understand that, and it's not just a verse in the Bible, but it's a truth that you live by. It starts changing the way that you handle the fire and the trials and the turbulence in your life because you start saying, okay, God, I can hold on just a little bit longer, but give me your strength. And listen to the next verse. It says, who by God's power, verse 5, 
are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. God not no uh, God doesn't only keep an inheritance for you, but he keeps you for the inheritance. God is not just saying, hey, I'm keeping a special gift for you in heaven. I'm preparing something special for you. No, God gives you the strength when you feel like I can't go on any longer. God says, don't worry. I will be your strength. Don't worry. I'll support you. Don't worry. I'll strengthen you. Don't worry. I'll give you the energy to move on. Don't worry. I'll give you the right perspective. Don't worry. I will give you the power to keep moving forward when you feel like I am ready to give up. God's saying, don't you give up because my power doesn't run out. You're holding on. And you feel like I can't hold on any longer. And God is just saying, just tap into my power. And when you see a transformed life, It's not somebody who woke up and started getting their life all back together. It's somebody who realized the power of God is the only way to transform and change your life. The most transformed, powerful lives you see, stories you say, I don't know how they became that person, is people that realize their dependence upon a God who has infinite power, say, I'm not going to try to do it in my own power, because that would be crazy. I'm going to rely on your power, and when I feel like I'm going to give up, I call out to you, and you provide me with the power and the strength to not give up, but to keep pushing on. See, God's people are a people of person perseverance God's people don't quit when we understand the power is in him I finish with these verses he says in verse 6 in this you rejoice though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials you know what I want to say this, and I say that at every, every, every funeral and wake that I'm at. It's okay to grieve. Peter's saying, hey, listen, I know some of you feel like you're going through the worst time in your life right now, and it's okay to grieve. It's okay to cry. It's okay to, to feel like you, you lost something. Or to, to miss a season or somebody that was in your life that's not, not only there. Peter's saying, it's okay to grieve. You know, sometimes people have good intentions, but they don't know how to execute them in the right way. I remember I was talking with, I was with two guys, and one guy was just going through the worst season of his life, and he was at a low, low moment, low. And he was just like, I'm, I'm discouraged and I'm depressed and this and I lost this and this is going on. And this other brother, he had good intentions. He, he wanted to encourage him, but he did it in the wrong way. He said, hey, you don't, don't grieve. God's good. Hey, just get over your season. Hey, just flip it off. Hey, you know, God's good. Hey, you shouldn't be sad at any time in your life. God's good. Just be happy. He's just kind of like, hey, just drink this happy Kool-Aid and you'll be all good and your problems will go away. And sometimes we can get lost in that type of weird thinking that God doesn't want us to cry. God doesn't want us to grieve. God doesn't want us to feel like we've lost something. And the Bible says there's a time to grieve. There's a time to grieve. People don't need you to tell them, hey, don't grieve, just be happy as you're a Christian, nothing goes wrong. What they need to know is, hey, it's okay to grieve and God sees you. God sees you. And this other verse finished, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Come on now. Though you have not seen Jesus physically, you love him with your life. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 
last thought, if you see here, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that's inexpressible. This word for joy that's inexpressible is used one time in the Bible and one time only. One time. It's a joy that's so profound that it's beyond the power of words to express. It's a joy that comes from God. That even when you're in the worst season of your life, that even when you've lost everything, a Christian still has a hope and a joy that cannot be robbed from them. Even when you feel like everything is going wrong. Let me be super clear with you this morning. I'm not saying that, there's, that you shouldn't grieve the people you lose or you shouldn't grieve a job that you really love that you, you no longer have or you shouldn't grieve something that's difficult in your life. Grieve, grieve. But there's an unhealthy form of grieving when you grieve too long that it turns into depression. And I've seen a lot of people who they're unable to deal with the grief and the Bible talks about, the Bible talks about that we do not grieve like those without hope. And as a Christian, God doesn't just want your high mountaintop moments. God wants your brokenness. God wants your low moments. God wants your pain. God wants your tears. God wants you. Even when you say, like, I, no one wants me, that's when God wants you. He calls you to himself. And when you are broken, the first title that's used by the Holy Spirit is he is a comforter. That God actually comforts the brokenhearted. And even when you've been stripped of everything, you can still have a joy that remains in Christ when everything else is gone. I have lived out and experienced this life. It doesn't mean that I don't go through storms. It doesn't mean I don't go through trials. It doesn't mean I don't grieve. Man, I've grieved. I've grieved. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that in the middle of losing people you love, in the middle of having tragedy strike you, you can still have a joy, and it's a joy that comes from God.